Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Cofactors webinar series. So I'm Komalesh KP from Cofactors. Today's webinar topic is how to scale a small business. So before we go further, I want to view the functionality and procedure of the webinar. Duration of the webinar is one hour. Questions will be taken at the end of the session. So in question and answer session, you can type your questions in the chat or you can click on the hand icon in the control panel to raise the hand. And you will unmute, you can ask questions directly in person. So, okay, without further ado, we'll come to the main part of the webinar. So it's time to introduce our speakers. Today we have Kenny Schumacher, a founder of Delizine, and Vimal Murli, who is a co-founder of Core Factors. So now let's begin with Kenny. Hi Kenny, welcome to the webinar, and it's over to you. Hi everyone. It's really my honor to speak with you today, and I'm really excited to uh, share my story of how to scale your small business and how you can do it as well. So about a year and a half ago, I sold my small business that I scaled from less than 5,000 monthly recurring revenue to over 20,000 US monthly recurring revenue in less than eight months. Prior to the growth, I really did struggle to push the company past 5,000 monthly recurring revenue. But once I started effectively scaling the company, the growth skyrocketed and led to the company's eventual sale. Presently, I am the founder and CEO of another company, Delazine, which was founded around one year ago, December 2018. We're a productized service that provides businesses with unlimited designs for a flat rate and have now grown to over 26 members of our team uh, from essentially two in December of last year. We work with many clients in India and I'm very happy to share my story with you today on tips on how you can scale your business and then eventually possibly even sell it in the future. So I made this presentation with the perspective that it really doesn't take a genius to scale and sell a business. Uh, in fact, it doesn't even require any previous experience and I'm proof of this. My experience with scaling small businesses has primarily been with scaling service-based businesses, uh, which often are seen as difficult, if not impossible, to scale. Um, as such, my presentation today on scaling a business um, will primarily be from the perspective of scaling a service-based small business. Um, however, these principles can be applied towards really all small businesses. You could say that I had no real business experience prior to selling my business. I graduated in 2016 with degrees in accounting and finance, and I had interned the year before at a public accounting firm. Um, I'm thankful for the experience of interning there because it confirmed that accounting was not for me. Um, so while I knew that I didn't want to do accounting, I didn't really know what career was right for me. Um, I was interested in entrepreneurship and had explored it in college by creating a few small businesses, uh, one of them being a mobile app to help people discover the best local meals. Um, but of course, at the time I was in college and I was you know, pretty poor, I couldn't really afford any marketing for this uh, the small business but I needed a way to get targeted traffic to our app. Uh, so this app it lets you search and discover specific meals in your city. Um, for example, you could search pasta and get results of the best pasta dishes. The app was location specific, meaning that um, while we want to target foodies, we only want to target foodies in a specific city that we would be launching in. So eventually I got the idea to market on Instagram. I would create city-specific Instagram accounts and post pictures of the best food in that city. I would then interact with people living in that city who showed an interest in food. These people would return uh, and they'd see my page and they would likely to follow it and like our photos. It was easy to replicate this across all major cities in the US and eventually this turned into its own thing with me managing a few hundred accounts and had a cumulative total following of several million followers. While I was doing this, I noticed that I was pretty good at growing a following on Instagram. Others noticed this as well, and people even started paying me to manage their Instagram. By this point, I was in my senior year of college. I had a few clients paying me to manage their social media. It was, you know, I was doing everything from creating posts to scheduling them, to replying to comments, uh, using their accounts to interact with those in their target audience, doing pretty much everything you can think of on social media. And I didn't realize it at the time, but the business that I was building at this, at this point at least was absolutely not scalable with how I was proceeding. Things eventually got a little overwhelming too, and I really wasn't being paid all that much. But you know, while I was in college, it was enough for me to survive at least. 
the truth was that while I was able to perform all these activities for clients, the only area that I really felt like I had specialty in was in growing their following and exposure on Instagram uh, through the method of using their account to interact with those in their target audience, uh, similar to the method that I mentioned from the, uh, the mobile app. So everything else, like creating social media posts or managing their pages, I didn't really have all that much confidence in at the time. Plus, there wasn't anything that was really automated or streamlined about creating social media posts or managing their pages that I could see from my perspective at the time at least. It was all manual work, and as each client was different, it was difficult for me to streamline this process. However, the way that I would grow the client's following and exposure on Instagram was, for the most part, automated. It still required a lot of experience to do it effectively, but once you had that experience, you could easily grow the following of any type of Instagram page. To put it simply, we would use the client's account to follow people within their target audience on Instagram, like their posts, and engage with them. This resulted in those people we interacted with through our client's accounts, viewing the client's accounts, and since they were within the target audience, they would likely to have a genuine interest in the client's page. This resulted in increased followers for our clients, and even more importantly, it increased the sales for them. So this part of the business was doing well, and I was really providing a lot of value to our clients. But there was also the other part of the business that I managed, you know, their social media pages and all of that, and that was, that was really different. It was impossible to focus on getting new clients for, you know, the service that was doing so well, the Instagram exposure service, when I had to spend all of my available time managing other client pages manually. It was really getting so exhausting, and this other part of the business wasn't something that I particularly enjoyed. So I decided to focus entirely on the one aspect that I did enjoy, which was growing their exposure on Instagram. Doing this part of the business required a short consultation, and then after that, everything would be automated. Uh, but by focusing on this, I wouldn't be able to manage social media pages for clients or create their social media designs. So clients wouldn't be happy if I told them suddenly that I would no longer serve them, uh, which caused a dilemma for me. Ultimately, though, I decided to do what was at the time. So with that mindset, I alerted my clients that I would only be focusing on this one aspect, the Instagram exposure, and would be unable to help with the other areas of social media management. Of course, this upset some clients and it caused them to leave, uh, but focusing on this one specialty that I could provide was the first step towards creating a scalable business um, unknown to me at the time. By focusing my offerings only on this, our business became known soon as experts in the field of Instagram exposure. And eventually I was able to get more clients that I can handle for this particular service. So at this point in time, I graduated college and I was making a decent amount of money through this small business. Uh, but at the same time, I was spending the majority of my life doing customer support, uh, onboarding clients and managing and maintaining existing clients' accounts. There, of course, was a limit to how much I, as one person, could do, and I knew that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life doing this. So, like many small business owners, however, I was hesitant to delegate. First off, I found it unlikely that anyone I could hire could do what I was doing, as well as me. And second of all, I didn't want to eat into my profits by hiring someone. But I knew that the only way that I could grow the business, as well as have some free time for myself, was to delegate. So that's what I did. And eventually I had three full-time employees, well, actually four full-time employees, really one manager, that managed over 800 client accounts, uh, which would really have been impossible if I tried to do it all on my own. Best of all, after I had delegated everything to my employees, the business was able to run on its own without my input. I really only had to spend about two hours each month to manage this business, and it continued to grow at the same time. So why was I able to scale my business when so many other businesses are not able to do so? Well, by definition, a scalable business needs to be growable, provide value to its customers, and of course, be profitable. That means that it needs to be possible to sell more units, service more clients, or onboard more users. And it needs to be able to do all this without being reliant on any one individual. That means that if the business owner was to go on vacation, for example, the business should not cease to exist. Um, so as, as a good example of this, of a typical service-based business, let's compare the business of a copywriter. So 
imagine a copywriter. If the copywriter were to go on vacation, the entire business would cease to operate. And in many small businesses, even those that aren't service-based, this is often the case. In addition, while a copywriter can onboard more clients and have high profits, they will soon reach a limit due to their limited amount of time. Even if they work, say, 24 hours a day, they would not be able to service, you know, say, 1,000 active clients at once. While it's common, this kind of small business is not scalable at all. So I want you to ask yourself, can your business run without you being present daily? If you were to go on vacation, would your business still operate? If the answer to this is no, then I want you to ask yourself why. I then want you to ask yourself how you can make your business less reliant on yourself. Throughout this presentation, I'll be providing examples and situations that will likely be relevant to you and will allow you to be better to better turn your business into a scalable one. So let's go back to the example of the copywriter once more. We've determined already that a single copywriter offering her services as a business is not scalable. Even the traditional agency of copywriters is not necessarily scalable as the business's success is likely reliant on a few individual players and it will take a lot of time to acquire new clients and resources to serve them. Due to this, most traditional service businesses are very difficult, if not impossible, to scale. So the copywriter or the agency of copywriters will likely take on any project given to them, which you know, could range from blog posts to PR to editing to really anything else that they would do. And likely this is all from different industries. So even if the copywriter hired an assistant or tried to delegate, or if the agency hired more copywriters, it would take a long time to train them to be able to handle all these different types of projects and industries. That's not to say that you know, copywriting or agencies aren't a good business. I mean, they could very well be hugely profitable businesses, but they're really not scalable, at least in the traditional sense. So if you're interested in turning your business into a scalable one and one that can be sold, You'll need to cut out all things that are not scalable, focus your business on the area it can provide the most value, and then delegate responsibility. So instead of the copywriter or copywriting agency providing a copywriting service, they will need to provide a copywriting product if they want to scale effectively. Think of how a traditional service works. You, as the person being provided the service, you consult with a service provider, and then they provide you with a solution that's tailored to your specific needs. The service they provide you with will be different than the solution they provide another client in most cases, and they likely will even charge different rates for different clients. With all of this customization and moving pieces, it's, it's really difficult, if not impossible, to scale with this kind of structure. With all these different pieces, just think about how difficult it would be to, say, train a salesperson to know how to handle all the different kinds of client requests. Think of how difficult it would be also to hire employees who would be good at all the different kinds of services that you offer. But instead, think of how a product works. A product has strict limits, and by definition, it isn't able to be customized. If the customer likes your product, then they'll purchase it, and if they don't like it, then they won't. It's, it's very simple. There isn't any room for customization, which means that you can easily streamline the process of marketing, sales, growth, and most other aspects uh, that line with growth in the company. So let's go back to this agency again. So this hypothetical agency determines that their agency is strongest at blog posts. Due to their experience with this, they have created a strong structure and a formula to effectively create blog posts, regardless of the industry of the clients. Instead of providing copywriting services, they could focus on a strict copywriting package to create, for example, example, say 12, 1,000 word blog posts with a limited agency one product and hire copywriters that specialize in blog posts. And suddenly now they have a scalable model. They can focus all their attention on blog posts, which they specialize on, and all their marketing attention now goes towards those that need blog posts. They can hire only those that specialize in blog posts so that instead of having employees that are mediocre in writing blog posts, everyone on their team is a specialist at this. The quality of their offering therefore improves and soon they're known as being the best at blog posts. They get referrals, they get continued business, 
and they can continue now to grow. The business owner can spend their time hiring people to take over their responsibilities. Instead of doing all the sales themselves, they can now hire salespeople that specialize in selling products. Because it's so much easier to, to sell a product because there's no customization. It's this is what it is. If you don't like it, that's, that's just the end of it. So it's much easier to hire salespeople for these kinds of products. Instead of managing the copywriters, they can hire managers. They can then continue to hire as they continue to add more clients. And eventually the business owner may not even need to spend much time at all on the business. So of course, this is a service-based business, so it's not as scalable as software, for example. Uh, but this hypothetical small business is now effectively taking advantage of the power of scaling. With this simple example, I've provided one way to scale a service, which is by turning it into a product, or in this case, a productized service. But the underlining method really works for any type of small business, which is to cut out the offerings that are not scalable, focus on the area, the business that can provide the most value, and then delegate responsibilities. So I want you to think about your small business if you have one. What offerings do you have in your business that aren't scalable? Maybe you have a SaaS, for example, that provides marketing automation, but in order to get more money, you start accepting consulting offers from users who ask for your help. Even if this adds revenue to your business needs, in order to really experience scalable growth, you'll need to cut out any offerings that are not scalable. Often this is gonna mean sacrificing short-term gains to instead maximize towards the long-term goal of growth. I also, want to ask, I, want, I also want you to ask yourself, what is it that your business is best at? Maybe your business tries to do everything. And you know, for large organizations, they may be able to do this, but the truth is that your small business can't. And that in order to really compete and distinguish your business, you'll need to focus on the area that you specialize in or your business specializes in and can provide the most value to your customers. Focus and optimize your business towards this. But maybe you're not really sure what this is, so ask your customers. There's, there's no shame in sending out a survey to your customers to find out what the most value you provide is to your customers. Or maybe view what products or services have the highest profits and results and the happiest clients through that. Lastly, delegate responsibility. As, a, as an example, you've probably seen like the restaurant owner who's always spending time working at the register, cleaning up or doing things that would make a lot more sense for one of their employees to do. I'm not saying this you know, from the, the hierarchical perspective of the owner being too good to clean or, or to do that work. I'm not saying that at all, but what I am saying is that the restaurant owner's time is extremely limited as well as valuable. They could be using the time and to provide tremendous value to the business, such as by working on partnerships, expanding the business into other areas, or strategizing on new initiatives. But if they're instead spending their time working the register or doing anything else that they could hire someone for minimum wage to complete, then there's really no way the business will scale unless that quickly changes. So you may laugh. I mean, that's, that's a pretty obvious example of how a business will fail to scale if that continues. But I'm guessing that there are likely things that you're doing too in your business that should be delegated to someone else to allow you more time to focus on high return activities. One example that I often see is the small business owner being heavily involved in customer service. And you know, sometimes the business owner is the customer service team. When you're just starting off, it, it can make sense for the small business owner to play a huge role in customer service as it's, of course, important for the business owner to be very aware of how the customer is doing. But beyond that early stage, it can become very detrimental in allowing the company to scale. The business owner may think that hiring someone else will result in a worse customer support experience. And while this may be true, at least initially, as you're training a new person, what's really important is that this allows you the time and the freedom to pursue other areas to improve your business. I want you to instead think of things in terms of the opportunity cost, which by doing something, you are now unable to do something else that may be of more value to your business. Don't optimize to cut costs, but instead optimize to increase revenue in a scalable fashion. So in my previous business, I knew that I needed to hire in order to scale that business, but it was really difficult to hire for a few reasons. Uh, I mean, I was still just graduating college so I had 
no experience really in doing this. And I was thinking of things too much in the short term. Um, so with that line of thinking, hiring people meant that in the short term, my profits would be lower due to having to pay an employee who would, you know, not likely be productive for some time. Also, hiring meant that I would need to spend more time training new employees, and my time was very limited. This meant that I may need to cut back on some profitable activities now in order to allow time for this and going forward as well. Ultimately, this resulted in uh, my business's growth being delayed uh, relatively significantly as well. Uh, the problem is that I was thinking too much on the short term when I really should have been focusing on the long term, uh, the goal being growth. In the short term, I mean, sure, I may have increased expenses and I would have to spend additional time training these employees. But in the long term, I would have delegated the task and allowed myself more time on other high level activities. Another problem that I in, uh, I hired an employee who quickly became a problem. They played a crucial role in my business, but they really didn't follow the rules. They interacted poorly with others on the team. And this caused me lots of stress. While I did eventually let them go, it was many months later than I should have. I did a long-term goal of growth and scalability. I feared that there would not be anyone to cover that person's role when in reality, I should have let them go sooner and then spent all my time and energy focusing on finding a replacement and covering them in the meantime. About a year after really scaling my business, I decided that I wanted to sell it. When my business sold, it really felt like a thousand pounds of weights were taken off of me and I could finally breathe. While my business sale went well and was relatively quick, it was a new process for me and I'm sure it's going to be a new process for many of you that follow the same paths. I wanted to include this process of selling the business in the presentation because if you're able to scale your business effectively, your business will be in a position where it likely will be very attractive for potential purchasers. On top of that, if your business has scaled well, it's likely to be very attractive to buyers. So you may as well be aware of this as this is a possibility for your business. In my experience, I worked with a mergers and acquisitions firm that specialized in selling online businesses. The process was relatively straightforward. You know, I mean, I, I contacted them and provided them with information about my business. And a few days later, I had scheduled a call with the owner of the firm. During the call, he quoted me what he thought the business could sell for, which was surprisingly higher than I was, what I was hoping for. And soon, I was working with his team to provide more detailed information about the business, including a lot of financial information. So um, I know it's easy to not keep track of these things, but you definitely need to keep very, very detailed reports on your business, especially as you scale and things get more complex if you want to sell your business. In less than a month, I was already speaking with interested buyers. I mean, we, we were able to sell the business relatively quickly because the business had proven growth, was scalable, and due to the scalability and delegation, it was almost entirely passive from the business owner's perspective. So what are the characteristics of a sellable small business? Buyers have to think that they look at business. There's always exceptions to these rules, of course, but today I'll be examining what buyers will look for when looking for a small business to purchase and what you'll want your business to look like for the highest valuation. So as you may have guessed by now, they want a scalable business that has shown consistent signs of growth. A lot of characteristics a buyer will look for in a business to purchase are the same characteristics of a scalable business. So if you're gonna be focusing on scaling anyways, you might as well be aware of this opportunity to sell it and then optimize for this. To get the highest valuation, your business should not be dependent on any single person. In some service-based business acquisitions in which the business owner plays a huge role in the business, the business owner on and works several years business, often with order during length of future performance, which of course may be outside of their control and isn't a great deal for the seller. That's why having a product or a service that is product is be if you want business, in addition to being scalable, of course, too, as I mentioned. So 
So ideally, the business owner will be self-sufficient, or the business will be self-sufficient without the previous owner or the new owner's direct involvement. In my case specifically, the buyer owned multiple businesses and they wanted to add additional money to their portfolio for largely passive income. If your business is scalable and you are considering selling it, then I'd say pay attention to these factors to increase your to show growth pattern. I think your business has been consistently growing for over a year. A buyer wants to avoid purchasing a business that will fail after being purchased, of course, and showing a long history of growth reduces that likelihood. In addition to growth, a potential buyer will want to see other positive metrics such as high gross margins, low customer acquisition costs, and low churn. Try to focus on improving your metrics as best as possible well in advance to listing your business to sell. So, what is your business's competitive advantage? What causes your clients or users to continue using your products or your services? Maybe you have technology that's patented, or maybe the business is a leader in the industry, or maybe you have a competitive advantage that can be things like excellent customer service. Lastly, help from a reputation firm that's special in selling business to your business. and even if you have experience your time is likely better spent as is attractive to a buyer than on trying to do this all on your own so so whether you have a scalable business already and you want to sell it or you're working on making your business scalable or have yet to even start your own business I hope that my talk today has been encouraging and has provided you with information that you can use to start today So thank you very much for listening. Um, that's my presentation. I'd love to answer any questions uh, that you have today. So hi, thank you, Kenny. It's really a great uh, sharing the information about the scaling your small businesses and the importance of copywriters, like and the problems you face. So it's really a, a nice information. So thank you. So we'll go for the question and answer. So if anyone has a question and answer, so kindly use the chat box there to type a questions or else you can raise your hand now by pressing the hand icon there so we will unmute you and you can ask questions directly so okay fine skinny we'll go for that uh, vimal so like uh, if they are having any questions so we can take it at the end of the session so is it fine okay yeah that sounds right should yeah. i uh... Stop sharing my screen now? Yeah, I'm going to share. So now Vimal will continue the session. So hi Vimal, it's over to you. Hello. Hello everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Kamlesh, for your introduction. Uh, very informative uh, presentation by uh, Kini uh, on scaling small businesses. Thank you, Kini. Oh, thank you, too. Yeah. Uh, since uh, I'm helping 300 plus uh, small businesses by providing CRM solutions and see that uh, successes, uh, I would like to share how uh, to scale your business using CRM, right? So there are many factors involved in scaling your business. I take this uh, uh, opportunity to uh, to share how uh, the business scale using CRM. So most of them have a question that what is CRM? As an entrepreneur or as a small medium entrepreneur, they doesn't know what is the term of CRM, right? And also they have uh, questions about like what is CRM and how it will be helpful for us. Okay, so uh, CRM is uh, customer relationship management. Uh, which helps to uh, streamline your business process as also helps to improve your customer relationship and also in, helps to uh, improve your employee productivity. So, uh, sorry. So I'll just go over this uh, five ways uh, CRM helps you to grow. Okay, so I will summarize it because since uh, Koblesh has given less time to me, um, I'll. Uh, uh, go with five ways CRM helps you to grow in business okay so if you find uh, these are the major 
uh, five problems uh, or maybe the five solutions which I I given to the uh, clients which I worked for last six years. Okay, so the CRM helps uh, to find the right customers. Okay, so uh, we spend more money on uh, uh, resources, uh, generating leads, but uh, finally finding a right customers into this is a difficult task for a small medium businesses. Right, so using CRM they can able to. Find the right clients, okay. So uh, to avoid the junk leads and to uh, to have a right follow up and right task, so you can able to create uh, select the right customers over here, and then building sustainable relationship. For forty five percentage of sales leader says maintaining a, a deeper customer relationship are a key objective for sustainable six uh, business, right? And also comes to the third point, increase uh, employee productivity. Okay, so uh, CRMs helps you to uh, increase your employees productivity by act, uh, by do, giving uh, right follow-ups on time, by doing right task on time, by uh, acting fast to the leader uh, leads and then close the leads. And then offer the best customer support. Okay, so uh, we, would, we all know that 50% of uh, customers wanted to pay for a, a bit better customer experience with the company, right? So uh, CRM helps you to give a better customer service. Right? And finally, it is improve customer retention, right? So uh, will, which CRMs, uh, which has a complete database of your leads or your customers, prospects, so that we can uh, we can have a complete history of the clients and where we can able to upsell, resell your products and where we can able to uh, keep your customer retention on this. Uh, without so much harder, so I'll just uh, go with some case studies. Okay, so I met this gentleman, Mr. Balaji Pasumati. Uh, he is a uh, heading BNI uh, uh, executive director of Bangalore. Also, he is running a business called Golden Square uh, Co-working Space. Okay, I just uh, I met this gentleman on December uh, 2018, and uh, he. Uh, uh, he come up with a problem statements. Okay, he is also a, uh, a startup company in 2018. Okay, so he had uh, this, this problem statement with me. Okay, so uh, these are the problem statements like uh, lead distribution, uh, no timely interaction with leads, monitoring five branches sales teams, no proper communication with the leads. So usually this gentleman has five branches in uh, in and around Bangalore. So he receives many leads from various sources, okay, from website, he do digital marketing, he getting referral leads, and then distributing these leads to the uh, the sales executives are a difficult task for him. And time, uh, no timely interaction with the leads. When after receiving leads, after spending so much resource and money and getting the leads, and uh, when you are make, we are not making a timely interaction with the leads, the, the opportunity of lo losing this lead is very high, okay. And monitoring five branch sales teams because I see these five branches are in different places. Okay, the leads receive receives from different branches. The where as an entrepreneur you could not find. Okay, what happens to the leads received to this each branches? Okay, and the, no proper communication with the clients. Okay, even um, uh, even if uh, it when people uh, sales executives talk to the leads. Okay, as in. Uh, entrepreneur, we don't know what communications they are making with the clients, whether they are the right communications, whether they are pitching the right uh, uh, content. Okay, so it, it is a problem of uh, Mr. Balaji. Okay, and the solution which uh, I provided to uh, Golden Square in last year, 2018. So we given a solution of auto lead assignment to sales representatives. So when there is a lead received from various sources, like just dial website or maybe a referral or to any landing pages on your social social uh, mediums. So what we are uh, given the solution to capture the leads and automatically assign the leads to the sales representative. Let's an example. One person is uh, expert in uh, 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 one person is expert in this uh, particular domain and the person other person will be expert in some other domain right so we uh, help them to understand who is uh, uh, expert in which domain so is respective of the lead so we uh, we capture the lead we capture uh, and we assign the leads to the right rep uh, representative and install uh, in instant call connect with the leads the most probability of losing leads when you call the leads after uh, 
uh, one hour, maybe uh, the when we missed a lead and then we are calling the next day, the most probability of losing the lead is high. Okay, so we are being given a solution of instant call connect. So whenever the lead received uh, from any of the sources which we talked about now, so which will automatically connect the sales representative, so that actually the chances of missing lead is very lower, less. And mobile application for every individual to track. Okay, since uh, the problem statement is for five branches managing the five branches, so we given mobile application to all these five branches. Multiple sales executives are available, so we given uh, application to track all the leads. Whenever the lead comes, is automatically assigned to the mobile application. They di directly act on the lead within a fraction of minutes. Okay, and they can talk to the lead. They can create a task follow-ups and when is the next meeting with the client uh, lead or prospect. So with this help, so they could reduce the lead leakage and implementing IVR system to track the communication. If you uh, see the last statement of uh, no proper communication with the clients. So we have uh, implemented an IVR system, probably everyone knows it. So which uh, welcomes your client with a professional voice and then um, or take the client to the right person. Okay, let's say the person calls to the uh, branch A and uh, when usually all companies has a, a, a receptionist where receive the calls and uh, uh, just ask what which department you want to talk or which branch you want to talk and then forward the call to the respective branch. Uh, using this uh, cofactors IVR system, we enable uh, the direct connectivity to the person. Okay, so you don't need to spend time on the receptionist, and you can directly land to the right branch whichever you want. Okay, and after this, um, the result of this particular uh, uh, CRM solution in last one year, so we uh, re uh, we reduced the 15% of lead leakage due to the lead scoring and better allotment of executives which I talked about uh, in the last slide, okay, when assigning the leads to the right sales executives with who has a domain knowledge on this, so it reduces 15% of lead lock uh, loss and 20%, 22% more conversions on leads due to instant follow-ups, okay. Most of the companies or uh, employees fails to follow up the leads in the right time. Okay, when you follow up on the next day, as I said, the loss of, uh, losing of lead is very high. So we reduce that 22%, uh, we have increased the more conversion on this instant follow up. And then we have increased 25% in customer retention. Okay, using CRM, okay, as I informed earlier, we, we can able to upsell, resell, and then which helps Golden Square to increase 25% on this customer retention. And finally, uh, before uh, a revenue of say, CRM, revenue before CRM using Teledews, they had 51% of revenue before using CRM. Okay, and what is the result? We have given them increase of 25% almost, and revenue after CRM is 76%. Okay, so which is um, where the Mr. Balaji was very happy on it. Okay, and this is how you can able to increase your revenue and productivity of your team by using CRM. Also, uh, I would like to know if any questions are in this, how to scale your uh, business using CRM. So I'll, uh, I'll happy to answer for this. So hi, so if you have any questions on this also, you can ask the questions. So hi, Kenny, are you online? Yes, I am. Sorry, yeah. I was muted. I can. I'm here. Yeah, fine. So, Kenny, there is. So, there's a couple of questions. So, so you can read out the questions or so questions from Mauna Chella. So, I will read out the questions. So, that was a good session to know the methodology used. So, this the question is: Is your cash flow? positive each month and the second question is what is your pricing strategy and why so yeah what okay. can you can answer the question sir. yeah that's a great question Mona thank you for uh, for asking that so I'm going to answer this from the perspective of the previous business that I sold um, that was the focal point of this uh, this presentation so this business was an Instagram marketing service it was a, a service but it was more of a productized service 
Um, so we charged the clients upfront. And thanks to this, it was definitely cash flow positive each month. Um, we used some software for this business and it was primarily software as well as a little bit of um, client managers and customer support. Um, so for the most part, our expenses were very low and this resulted in high profits that was definitely cash flow positive each month. Did spend some money on advertising, but actually a lot of our growth was uh, due to referrals. We had an affiliate program, and all of this resulted in, I would say, for the most part, organic growth um, that didn't require too much uh, ad spend. So, yeah, thanks to this, it was uh, cash flow positive each month. Uh, our product um, So, as I mentioned, it's a service, but it was more of a product type. So we found one aspect of our Instagram and we executed this really well. We just only focused on one aspect of this uh, type of service. And due to this, we made a very simple monetizing uh, subscription rate. It was $30 per month for one account. We relatively low for our services for what we're getting. Uh, our clients are going and turn just friends there. So it's a bad one as a real any price as well. But we found that it was primarily people that want this month on print subscription rate to how we did. An event, I mean, print an evangelist of your business. You should be very, very proud of your business. You should be very confident in your business, and you should really let others be aware of that. Um, it's not necessarily being cocky about your business, but it's just being passionate about what you do, what your company does, uh, what your founders do for the company, and how much value you can provide to people. Um, so that in itself should already already result in people that are interested in learning more about your business, maybe. Um, in regards to uh, ideally, your team should have all the skills needed to uh, to provide service or your stuff or your your product. Um, that should be the default, I would say. Um, assuming that is the case, um, I mean, of course, as I mentioned in this talk, you can't do everything yourself, right? Um, it's it's impossible to do everything on your own. So you have to delegate to really grow your startup. Um, so as you continue to grow, um, you should focus on hiring people that can perform certain actions for your startup that you've determined are now uh, what you need the most help with. And then once you find that person, you should then look and see, okay, uh, now that that's taken care of, I'm gonna focus on these other aspects of my business. And then I'm gonna find other people that can do those other aspects that I need help with. And eventually you keep on hiring and hiring and hiring so that all of these different roles are filled and then you know ideally you become a huge company that has many layers within the business um so all that is i guess you can i guess you can attribute that to just how much passion you have for your business on how to recruit these people ideally you have you know the funds to afford hiring these people um or i guess you could always do equity as well but ideally you uh, are able to represent this passion for your company when you try to recruit people onto your team So I hope, okay, so I hope that Anu, Anush uh, G got an answer from Kenny. So now we'll move on to the next question. So like if you have any questions, so you can type over there or you can raise your hands. So we'll be waiting. So hi, can you, can you see any questions over there? Uh, yes, yes, I yeah. can. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can read out that question and you can uh, start answering to that. So like. Okay, let me do that now. Yeah. Uh, so this is from... Jithin, it looks like uh, it was a good session on scaling business and you made clear statements about how hiring a good team is very crucial. My question is how important do you think, or how important is it to create a team of loyal employees uh, to an organization's growth? Also, what are the strategies 
strategies you have tried to make the employee satisfaction on a high level? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, you know, in order to scale your business, you need to have, you know, more employees, of course, right, to actually scale the business. So, yeah, that's, that's definitely a great question to ask. So there's a, a couple ways to answer this, I would say. Um, so ideally, the, the person that is, you know, that you're trying to hire, they have some interest in your business already. Um, ideally, like I mentioned in my previous uh, mention, that you're able to show your passion for your business and you're able to really convince people as to why this is a great business to, to work for, to want to work for, um, and all of that. Ideally, though, for anyone that you do hire, their incentives align with your business's long-term incentives. Um, it should be a good deal for them, and it should, of course, be a good deal for you as well uh, when they do well. You definitely want to find ways to align your growth with, uh, with their own success as well. So what I did in my previous business that I mentioned in today's talk is, well, for one, I paid them very well. Um, so these were, my employees were outsourced employees in the Philippines. Um, and in the Philippines, at least compared to the U.S., um, it's, it's a lot, uh, living there is a lot less expensive, which also meant that their local opportunities would result in a lot less uh, financial compensation. So um, I was able to pay them a very, very high rate compared to what they would otherwise get. And that, uh, that resulted in me getting uh, very, very high quality employees on my team. Uh, for two, I also provided them with a bonus based on certain metrics being met. Um, so in my case, my employees did a lot of things like customer service, uh, sales, uh, management of existing clients. So I made sure that when they did well with all this, um, I would reward them with bonuses. So that was primarily the financial aspect of, of how I lined uh, my goal of growth with their own personal goals. And then lastly, I made sure to promote within the company. So we had, um, as we continue to grow, we're growing relatively pretty rapidly within this short amount of time. Um, I made sure that, you know, those that were doing very well would then be promoted to managerial positions within the company. Um, so I made sure that, you know, whatever that they did, um, if they did well, then that would result in them uh, directly getting uh, benefits such as bonuses or pay increases or uh, additional responsibility. So I think that really does result in employees having a high satisfaction. I mean, ultimately, the work they do should be meaningful to them. That's, of course, the ideal. But I think that most people or most employees recognize that, you know, they're doing the job uh, to get, you know, to get paid at the end of the day, right? They're, maybe they have some internal uh, joy at what they do. And if they do, that's, that's awesome. Uh, but ultimately people, you know, they're doing the job because they're getting paid for it. So I think if you can align that somehow with your own company's growth, um, that will result in high satisfaction. So the next question, uh, was your overall vision, uh, is it directly proportional to growth strategy? Um, so my overall vision for this, this previous company uh, was for growth. Um, I had that. So, I mean, as I mentioned in the talk today, I, when I started, I didn't really know what I was doing. I just knew, uh, what I was relatively good at at the time, that one aspect of growth on social media uh, or on Instagram specifically. And that's what I optimized towards. Not so much because I thought, or because I knew that this was scalable, but it kind of just worked out to, to do that for me. In hindsight now, looking back at it now, I can now see that was the correct decision from a business perspective. But at the time, I was doing it because I wanted to just more. So at the time, my, my vision was on doing things that I wanted to do, that I you know, found joy in doing, that I was good at, and to provide value to my clients. Um, and this, as I was doing that, I could then see that, oh, my business was now growing a lot faster a lot more rapidly and it was now actually turning into a scalable business. So as I, I realized that, I then changed my vision to then focus on growing. And you know, as I mentioned in my talk today, I knew that I couldn't grow if I didn't actually grow my employees too. I couldn't grow my business, I mean, unless I also grew my employees. So I made sure to focus all my attention on hiring, uh, onboarding more clients, and uh, that resulted then in scalable growth. So, uh, thank you, Kenny. So, uh, all the questions are cleared. So, is there any question on queue? You are able to see the questions? Yeah, 
I think, yeah, there's one more question now. Let me uh, read it out loud. So the uh, question is a uh, very informative presentation today. I have a question for you. Um, I would like to know what kind of marketing strategies drives the ROI for you. Um, so that's a really great question. I think it's, it's often difficult to know how to spend your marketing budget if you even have a budget uh, because a lot of the marketing can seem like it's you're just throwing darts in the air and you hope that one sticks. And okay, to okay. be honest, uh, when I started, to me, it was very much that so. I didn't really know what would work. I tried, of course, the, the standards like Google, Google Ads, I mean, uh, Facebook Ads, uh, affiliate marketing, um, all kinds of things really to try to, to grow um, our sales and our revenue. Um, so what, what I really found worked for me in this business um, was to focus on ensuring the client was happy uh, through excellent customer service and, you know, by providing them with a lot of value through our, um, you know, through our service, right? So that in turn resulted in um, increased conversions from those who referred us to others. Um, so that was actually really huge for us. So I wouldn't really say that's a, a marketing strategy exactly, but it did result in free marketing essentially for us. We of course paid our affiliates um, a, a very, you know, very uh, a fair, generous amount. Um, but that was actually the, the biggest ROI for us, I would say. Um, so in our in my existing company, Dell Design, actually we've found the same thing to be true. We've been focusing on the, the customer experience and doing everything we can to improve that. And that has resulted in lots of clients that just continue with us, um, as well as clients that refer us to other clients uh, because of the success that they've seen from our service. So that's, personally, that's the best ROI that I've seen, focusing my time or my employees' time on you know, improving the customer service. And that in turn resulted in you know, increased consistent sales, growth, and additional clients. So that was my experience. Of course, I have tried other channels like Google, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Quora, pretty much everything we can think of. Um, but those generally, yeah, I'd say they work, of course, and they're still positive for us. But the, the best growth experience is just focusing on the customer is having with the product or service and letting them be the, the spokesperson for you. I believe that that was all the questions, but I'm more than happy to answer any more questions that anyone has, or uh, you know, if you have any more questions after, uh, please feel free to email me or add me on LinkedIn, and I'd be happy to answer questions there as well. Fine, Kenny, thank you. So if you have any questions or, uh, related to this topic, so you can reach uh, directly, you can see the slide board uh, on your screen there, so you can, uh, in a LinkedIn profile, so can you Schumacher? Or else you can reach him directly to email Kenny at the rate of design.com. So same way Vimal, so you can reach Vimal Murli. So his email ID I'm Vimal.m at the rate of core factors dot in. And you, you can find him on LinkedIn uh, at Vimal M. So like so finally it's time to end the session. So before that, a bit of pointer. So where you will all receive a survey asking about the session because this insert will help us to shape the future webinars very well. So, and also we will send you a link to the recording of the webinar. You can share it with your PTS and social networks. So on behalf of cofactors, once again, thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you, Imal. Thank you all for joining us today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Kenny. Thank you all.